Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Richard Newman. Richard is the CEO and founder of an organisation called Body Talk and they are the global leaders in evidence-based communication training. His research on communication has been published in the esteemed Journal of Psychology and he's the best-selling author of the book you were born to speak, and I'm really interested to hear more about that. He's also the recipient of the coveted Cicero Award for speech writing. And today, we're going to dig deep into topics around the science of so storytelling, around personal presence, and around something that he calls leader's lift, which has really piqued my curiosity. And at each turn, we're going to think about, well, what is the lesson there from this communication expert, what are the lessons that we can apply to become better leaders? So without further ado, Richard, please say hello to our audience. Tell us a little bit more about your very interesting background and what led us, uh, what led you to be with us today. Thanks, Mick. Uh, well, I really appreciate you having me on the show. So to give you a bit about my, uh, my background, communication is an area I've always been completely fascinated with. Uh, and so uh, from uh, the age of 18, when I was just leaving uh, high school, I decided that I would uh, do something a little bit unusual. So I ventured off to the foothills of the Himalayas, where I was living in a little Tibetan monastery for six months uh, where I was teaching English to monks. And the big challenge being that when I got there, uh, they didn't know how to speak any English at all. They spoke Tibetan, Nepali, and Hindi, and I spoke a bit of French and a bit of German, uh, but there was no common language whatsoever. So I had to figure out how am I going to use body language and tone of voice to connect with them and to first of all, figure out where the lesson was going to be and get things started, and then to help them learn my language. And during the course of six months, I discovered that there's so much more to body language and tone of voice than perhaps we realized day after day that we could communicate a huge amount. And by the end of that experience, they could have a good conversation in, in English and I, I could make a good conversation in uh, Nepali, which was the main language of the area. And I came back to the UK just fascinated by this experience. And I'd always had this longing to, to study communication more so, but also to study acting. And so I went to a London acting school, professional acting school for three years, where I was really studying about you know, storytelling, stage presence, how to use your voice, how to use your body in a way that would help people on stage and in the audience feel something about your words. And so very shortly after that, I really put these skills together of the teaching and the, uh, the acting background, and then uh, was working uh, with, with building up my own business on communication training. And the first big project that we had was uh, working with a uh, well-known Formula One racing team, uh, where I ended up hosting over a thousand events for them in the space of five years, so 200 events per year. Uh, where their, their, their sponsors would come in from all over the world, people who are spending sort of 40 or $50 million a year to put a sticker on the side of a car that's being raced at 360 kilometers per hour. And uh, I was there and a couple of my team were there as well to help bring that information to life, to take that science, turn it into a compelling story and make sure that these people were captivated by the experience. And coming out of that, we then took a, a huge range of uh, techniques that we'd gained through the experience to, to build what we uh, teach today and sort of two decades later I'm still running this company and and teaching people worldwide in person and virtually well fantastic Richard and uh, first of all congratulations on your success and your own story is inspiring and thank you for sharing that with us there's quite a bit already there to unpack I want to mm. go straight back to the foothills of the Himalayas mm. how do you start a conversation where you're teaching someone a language where you don't have any common language to begin with? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and actually, uh, some sort of 13 years after I was there, I'd always said to them, you know, I'll come back one day. And it took me 13 years to, to, uh, to end up going back. And I went back with my, uh, my wife. And just near the monastery, there was uh, some people that I had made friends with uh, while I was there. Lots of great people in this uh, little uh, town. And there was a lady there who, though, um, she, she'd never been to school. 
uh, and she became a friend of mine, but she never, she didn't understand uh, any English sort of written or spoken. And we formed a very deep friendship though. And I remember sitting down with her, with my wife, and we were having this conversation for about 10 or maybe 15 minutes. And I suddenly clocked at the end of the 15 minutes. I thought, oh yeah, we're not, we don't have any common language. So she was speaking to me in uh, Nepali. I was speaking to her in English, but we thoroughly understood each other. I, I'd, I'd learned from her that her son, who I knew back 13 years ago, had grown uh, to be way taller than her and had flown off to Dubai. The one, the word that she said that I knew in English was Dubai and that he'd become a carpenter and he was very successful and happily married. And, and she'd explained all of these things to me without saying anything in English, just because her body language and her eyes, her facial expression, her tone was expressing so much to me uh, that, uh, that I was understanding every word. And it reminded me of what that was then like uh, when I was working with the monks. Now, now, when I'd been there for a while, I had to get quite inventive with how I would try and uh, put messages across. So at one point I was teaching prepositions. I thought, how am I gonna teach prepositions? I thought I have to do it physically. And so I devised this way of doing this with my hands and I got them to do it with me as well, uh, where, and this will come across, especially for people watching on the video. If you're listening, go watch the video and I'll show you how I do it. So I do this with my hands where I go um, up, down, into, onto, over, under, out, in front, behind, next to, opposite, round and round about. So that was when I had to get a little bit more technical uh, with pieces. But before that, I would do various pieces uh, with the monks who, you know, they, they were surviving through uh, getting some some donations for, from people uh, overseas. Uh, and occasionally those people would come to the monastery and they didn't quite know how to approach that. So I'd take all of the monks out of the little kitchen where we were doing the lessons around the front door uh, of the monastery and act out as if I was a visitor coming in and, uh, and then pretend to be one of them doing part of the conversation and let them copy what was happening. And so just simply sort of acting it out, mimicking, uh, going through scenarios with them was, was a great way through it. But generally speaking, being quite physical in the process, the key part when we were starting to teach things like emotions was that I realized I had to have a hundred percent congruency in my communication. This is a big, powerful lesson that I brought back and I now share with leaders and teams uh, that we work with, is that if I was trying to explain the word excited, if I didn't look excited and I didn't sound excited, then they had no idea what I was talking about. I could have been saying pineapple. And so I had to figure out a way to make sure that my body language, my voice and my word was totally congruent. And by doing that, they would gain understanding. Uh, and that's something that came with me back to the UK where I, I realized that so many people day after day are not congruent in their communication. So, so you get people uh, at work and they, uh, they have a team meeting and typically you get uh, a leader who'll say, um, hello everyone, I'm very excited to be here. And you think, well, you have to tell your face. You've got to tell me in your tone of voice, bring that word to life. Otherwise I'm not going to uh, believe you. But there's, there's so much that I've learned over the years that people are doing that destroys their congruency, gets rid of that congruency where they, they're not even aware that it's happening. It's just habits that people have built up uh, over the years. And so it's critical for people day after day to start to recognize the things they're doing that are incongruent to get rid of those pieces to come back to uh, as you, you mentioned the name of the book earlier uh, how they were born to speak because mm. we are born brilliant communicators as human beings compared to other species but this these incongruencies can really get in the way and pull us away from our ability to truly connect uh, with people around us so, so I've always thought when I'm doing a meet hosting a meeting having a presentation uh, or if I'm coaching a client, I'd think, would the monks understand this? Because if they would, there's full congruency here and the communication is going to work. That's a powerful question, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one away. I'm going to think about that when I'm preparing uh, presentations. Obviously, I do a, a lot of presentations every week. I'm going to ask myself that question. So would the monks understand that? Now, instantly, that'll be an anchor point for me that I'll understand what that means. That's a powerful question, Richard. Mm. We do talk a lot uh, to people and tell them that your body language screams louder than the words that you actually speak. What's the lesson there for leaders about that congruence that you speak of? Hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's become so important 
now more than ever to have somebody who we 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 truly buy into as a leader that we we believe in them authentically in every part of their life they are living and breathing the the vision and the mission that they're talking about and even more so we, we were talking just earlier about you know what this uh, pandemic has done to us where we have had that little window into people's lives to see uh, what they are like at home, what their you know what their home looks like, and what their cat looks like in in ways that we never would have imagined, and so uh, there there is no going back from that. There is no going back to the great big glass and steel buildings and putting on the corporate armor and pretending like that never happened. Uh, you know, people are now aware of the human behind the suit, uh, and so it, it's. It's so important to know that your, your interactions every single day with each person that you deal with need to match the vision that you've talked about, that mission that you're on, and, uh, and to live that out, not just in the actions and the decisions that you make, but in the way that you behave around uh, other people. You can't just send people an email saying what instructions are going to be and hope they're going to just just follow them blindly like people may have done many decades ago leaders need to be in a place where they are able to connect with somebody uh, and to do so completely authentically and and have a a clear and open agenda with that person and bring them on that mission with them from a place of not manipulation not transaction but truly bringing human beings together for something meaningful. Uh, and so, you know, congruent communication is critical for that to happen. Otherwise, people will feel like it's not important or they'll feel like uh, there's, there's something going on. They can't put their finger on it, but they don't trust this person. It, it, we've got to have that total congruency there for communication to work going forward, especially now where face-to-face -face interactions with other people are actually a rare commodity in the way that they didn't used to be. So those moments where you do get to be in a, in a room with someone, you've got, got to make them count and give them the, the respect and the value that they deserve. So I'm hearing three really powerful words in all of that, Richard. So the congruence, where everything matches. Your personal presence, everything about your body language matches your intent and the words that, you're, that are coming out of your mouth. I'm hearing about connectedness, that it's about that human to human connection. That is what inspires people to feel that respect that you, that you speak of, feel that they matter, that if you're connected with them, they feel like that they matter to you at that uh, specific moment. And then I'm hearing authenticity. And if you are congruent and you are connected, people are going to feel that you're authentic in the communication that you're sharing with them. How does that summary sit with you? Yeah, it sits with me really well. And I think that these are some elements that uh, people have aspired to, certainly for, for a while. Authenticity has been talked about for, for a, a good few years and, and with good reason. Uh, connectedness, I think, is becoming more important uh, right now because we have been through a phase of being locked in our homes and not able to go and hug our family. And so people are, are starving for that sense of connection and also a sense of purpose. Uh, in the work that they have. But the, the caveat I put behind this, because I often get this question, is that people tend to say, oh, does that mean, does that mean that I should just be myself in my next meeting, that I should just, you know, I go and do this presentation, host this team meeting and just be myself. And I say to people, it, that's not actually what it means. Because if you're going to be yourself, what that actually means is being all of the bad habits that you've been building up all the way through your life until this moment. And taking all of those bad habits into this next meeting isn't necessarily going to be great communication, unless you happen to have stumbled along that one sort of uh, true path of all the habits you've created in your life make you an extraordinary communicator. So it's worthwhile for people to know, even if I want to be authentic, and I want to be connected, I want to be congruent. To do that, you have to create a greater sense of self-awareness about what you may be doing, what habits you may have that are getting in the way of that, that may pull away your congruency, even though you're stating the truth, you've got good intentions, and you're still left wondering, why, why didn't this person respond well to me? So there's still that sense of um, greater awareness and working towards that congruent communication. Yeah, let's unpack that a little bit. That's really interesting, uh, Richard. So yes, show up as your authentic self and be there and be in the moment. Uh, but but you're also talking about your own self-awareness, right? So so 
are you saying or what, what role does that self-awareness play in the presence that you're having in that meeting, whether it be virtual or, or in a physical environment? Sure. So let, let's, uh, let's talk about um, having a team meeting. So, so many leaders who work with us have a, a fear or a reticence around uh, speaking to a, a group of people, whether that's their team or it could be speaking to the board or it could be speaking at a conference. And those events are going to become more important uh, now and for the next year or so, certainly, uh, because they are less frequent and suddenly there feels like there's more of a build up towards those moments and when people go in there let's say for example they've got a really serious message to give which might be along the lines of uh we absolutely must finish this by four o'clock on thursday now that that's the message that's the uh the outcome you want from everybody in the meeting now let's imagine it though that you say it in a way that is not congruent and this is what typically leaders uh, tend to do or anybody actually who, who stands up at the front of a room is uh, imagine someone who is standing at the front of a room and they're just slightly swaying from one hip to the next uh, back and forth maybe leaning casually on one hip for a moment then leaning casually on the other hip maybe just leaning off to one side for the whole time what they're doing is that they're physically comforting themselves potentially through the the nerves or the stress of a situation but by so doing they're standing in a position that is off center and if you gave that person a quick nudge with one hand they'd fall over they physically look like a pushover which is where that term or that phrase comes from gravity working against you not with you which means that your sentence and your statement does not have gravitas it has the opposite and so when you say that uh, with uh, you, we must get this finished by thursday at 4 p.m while standing and looking like a pushover, what people see and what people hear and feel is, yeah, it doesn't seem to matter that much if we get it done by four o'clock. You know what? I've got other plans on Thursday. I'll get it finished up on Friday. Uh, and so as just like a, a small and simple example there, the, the visual doesn't match the message. And when body language goes one way and words go the other way, people respond to, remember, and believe the body language, not the words. And so that's why you've got to make sure you've got things going in the right direction. So, so on that small piece, we coach people around physical gravitas, which comes from your posture being well aligned and being in a position where gravity works with your body, not against you. And you can do that for virtual meetings, one-to-ones or standing up and speaking with a group. And importantly, it doesn't mean sort of standing bolt upright like, like an army soldier in a parade. It's not about that. It, instead, it's about getting to a sense of alignment where you'll see this. If you turn on your favorite uh, sport, whatever it might be, tennis, basketball, uh, golf, and just watch what position people stand in when they're about to do something important. What is their ready position? They get their self into a position where their feet, their, their knees, their body, it's all aligned in a way that is working best for gravity. They are ready to perform. And we coach people how to do that at the front of a room so that they look like this message is serious. This message has gravitas so that everybody around the room understands that. And by doing that, they also feel more confident and appear more convincing. Uh, and this was um, something that we proved in a study that we published in 2016, I believe it was, which at the time, uh, as we understand, is one of the largest studies ever done uh, on nonverbal communication and especially uh, important for leaders, where we, we got people, we created over 100 videos uh, of people saying a message. And uh, they, uh, we, we got people from all over the world to, to watch the variations of this video. They'd watch one video and they had to vote at the end of the video. Uh, do you believe in this person? Are they convincing? Would they make a good leader? Would you vote for them in an election? A whole range of different points but they only saw one version of the video. And then when we were showing the other 99 versions of the video to different people in the same town, and then we would try it in other, other countries, people aged from 18 to 65 were taking part in this. Uh, men and women were, were voting on this. And we also had the variations in the video. Some had men, some had women, some were older, some were younger, some had lighter skin, some had darker skin, uh, because we wanted to look at all the variations. And what we found is it didn't matter if the person in the video was male or female didn't make any difference to the results, which was not what we expected. It didn't matter what their skin color was. It didn't matter if we were uh, getting our results from Mumbai or from San Francisco. These didn't make any difference to the results, which again, blew up our hypothesis. But what did matter is that people saying the same words and wearing the same clothes 
if they went from that position of being in, in pushover position, like I explained to Gravitas, then suddenly they've got a big spike in their results. They're more convincing. They're more likely to be seen as a good leader. They get more votes in an election. And we looked through a whole range of pieces there. And what I like most about this study is that all we were looking at is what if you go from being incongruent to being congruent? What if you go back to the way that you're physically, naturally born to speak, getting rid of habits, and suddenly by doing so, that the most impressive result we got was by going from a lack of congruency to complete congruency, you could increase the number of votes you get in an election by 59%. And genuinely, when we started looking, creating this study, I was hoping for a 5%. I thought 7% shift would be amazing. And, and the head of statistics at UCL who helped us put this together nearly fell off his chair when he gave us the results. He said, in 35 years, I've never seen results like this. Uh, so uh, it, it was quite fantastic to be a part of that project, but really uh, sort of uh, uh, really fulfilling to see that these results came not from manipulation tactics, but actually from bringing leaders back to the way that they are physically born to speak. There's so many things coming into my head right now, Richard. And the first thing I want to share with you it comes from a good friend of mine, David Knorr, who was on episode 39 of our podcast. Uh, and Knorr, I hope you're listening. I hope you're well. And one of the things that he shared with us on that day, he, his, his science is around the, uh, the power of relationships. W wonderful episode if you get a chance to listen to it. And there's something in that for everyone as well. But one of the things he shared and he was talking about authenticity at the time, was that almost everyone has a BS radar, a finely tuned BS radar. And what I'm hearing from you is that when you are incongruent, people will pick this up and they will interpret it in their way. Mm. What I'm also hearing, like when I hear you talk about gravitas, I've never thought of it that way, by the way, just wonderful. We use that word all the time, but thinking about gravitas comes from the word gravity and and this kind of balance that you talk about and someone that's got a, a strong and steady posture, you're going to believe what they're saying, right? And mm. whether it is nerves that is causing the sway because they're just out of their comfort zone or whether they're not confident in what they're saying, whatever the cause is, on the receiving end, people are going to interpret it in their own way. And it could be that they interpret it that, well, hang on a second, something's just not right here. And you brought up politics. How many times do you see a politician at a lectern saying something and you've just got this head in this m thought in your head where something's not matching here, right? So whether it's out of lack of confidence, your nervousness, or you're not confident in what you're saying, it doesn't matter if you're not congruent and you're not doing the things that Richard's talking about, people will draw their own conclusions. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I want to come to something that you mentioned in, in your brief that you gave before you came, came on the show. You spoke about personal presence and using small changes to increase your persuasion. Is this what we're talking about here or what, what else could you share there in terms of those small changes that leaders could make to improve their ability to inspire and persuade people into action? Yeah, so, so on personal presence, there's a few things around that. There is a physical aspect of presence. There's a vocal aspect of presence, but there's also a mental and emotional presence. So just to break those down, uh, the physical presence ties into what we were talking about there, being, being in a ready position to, to connect uh, with people and being free of habits that might uh, physically hold you back. Uh, vocal presence is something that we hear when we're listening to a great podcast or when we're listening to a great uh, audio book, that, uh, that voice that truly connects with us, where there is congruency between the sound that we're hearing and how we need to be feeling uh, on the page without it being overdone to the point where we, th we, we feel put off by it. It's, it's leading us down a path. Uh, and taking our imagination in the appropriate direction. But down to the, the mental and emotional presence, this is key. Uh, and this is something that, that is talked about so often, where if you look at uh, somebody who you look up to as a, as a great leader, and often people will talk about this maybe as uh, politicians and presidents, or someone who has extraordinary presence, they make you feel like the only person in the room that matters is you. And the only, mat the only moment that matters is this moment right now because everything that they're doing is totally focused 
on you right now and this conversation. And so that presence of mind is something uh, that we we like to coach people around ha having for their their conversations. We talk people through you know, di difficult situations, conflict resolution, or doing a presentation, negotiating, persuading people one to one or one to many, or, or being even in a virtual meeting. What is it that you can do to be focused right here in this moment? A and doing that. Me, requires people to stop being self-conscious and start being focused on the others, focused on the people who are there. So we find that uh, often people who are communicating poorly are just too much focused on them, their words, their needs, their slides, whereas people who have extraordinary presence are really with the other person, uh, totally focused on how they want those people to feel, uh, the, the journey and the direction that that conversation and interaction is taking from moment to moment. Uh, and to get there, uh, part of the, the coaching we give people on this is around the, uh, the mindset, getting to a place where you've primed your mind before an event so that you can show up as the best version of yourself, getting rid of any nagging thoughts, getting rid of the, the priorities that you've got and that burning to-do list and all the different uh, pieces that you need to get to after this meeting to make sure that you're focused on uh, your core values, what's important to you, and who is this person right in front of you in the journey that happens. So uh, when somebody does that with us, we, we feel it. And particularly if we're in a room with somebody, you get a, a genuine sense of that, that the, the wavelength of that person is on. But you, you can still get there in a virtual meeting because you, you show up and you realize the person, the person cares. They're interacting. They're not just here going, OK, and next slide and next slide. Uh, you, you feel that there is a sense of uh, a rhythm and a collaboration that is happening between the people who are there on the call. So, so the presence really needs to be approached from those three different sides. And if you get the, the three of them together, it's, it's utterly compelling. So I feel like we've circled all the way back to connectedness again there, Richard, mm. and, and the role in all of that. So having that presence, making the other person feel like they matter, that, that they are the most important person in your world right now. Um, one of my favourite sayings, by the way, is that, listening is not the same as waiting for your turn to speak so what i was hearing there is that you are connecting with the person and that you're taking a genuine interest in what they've got to say and you're making them feel that right so through through your presence so really really good richard i want to now flip it then and talk it from the other angle so we've been talking about your own personal presence and the way you portray yourself in the world what are the lessons that you can learn as a recipient? So, so when you're looking at the other person and you're watching them, what can we take from your, your, um, your research that you've done there, really powerful research? What can we take as leaders when we're looking at someone else that's communicating with us to pick up more than what they're saying? Mm, yeah, and th this is one actually that uh, people have been fascinated with, with the, the growth of, uh, of us doing virtual meetings. Uh, so many people have said, look, I just don't know how to read a room uh, anymore. How, how am I supposed to understand how people feel? And, and for me, it's actually in many respects gone in the other direction, because if you imagine when you're in a, in a standard meeting room, boardroom situation, you'll have people who are sat maybe seven, eight meters away from you, something like that, and lots of other things, sort of desks and chairs around. But when you're having a virtual meeting, the person that you're speaking to is less than a meter away. Even if there's seven of them, they're right there in front of you. So I always encourage people to make sure that, you know, have gallery view on and get the people who you're speaking to uh, all right there in front of you as close to the lens of the camera as possible so that you could be feeling like you're speaking to them directly and then you can look around and, and take a look at, at their faces. And, uh, and an exercise that we like to do on this is that uh, we give people a script to read where we say it's, it's, it's a script of two people talking to each other. Uh, and we say, okay, read this and tell us what you think is happening in this situation. And uh, people will come up with sort of random guesses about, uh, you know, something to do with there's, there's a, a tenant and, a, and maybe a, a, there's like a landlord there. They don't really know each other. They don't care about each other. They don't like each other. Maybe they're aggressive towards each other. It's sort of an argument. I'm not really sure. They're taking all of this from just the words. And then we play them the clip. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a clip from a, a well-known movie. And we, we say, here's the sound, just have the sound and the words, and now you tell me what's happening. And then they say, oh, these people, they really care about each other. And well, maybe he's more fond and she's less fond, but just notice how she's much happier by the end of the conversation. So just listening to tone. And then we say, okay, and now watch the, the uh, visual as well and see what happens. And uh, what people gain from this is that they realize the words by themselves, if you're in a meeting and you're just tuning into the words, you're going to go off in all kinds of wrong directions about what is actually happening. It's, it's not going to give you the information, the whole picture that you need. And frankly, if it was going to, you don't need a meeting. Just email the person, send them a text. But we all know how many times that goes wrong. If someone receives a text, they could read it in a different tone of voice. They get a different message. So uh, everyone talks to, about, to us about in this situation, the tone gave them a huge amount, but the visual gave them everything they needed to know. And so that's a nice lesson to think about when you're in a meeting. You spoke there about you know, the importance of listening uh, is that we encourage people to do three layers of listening, which is definitely listen to the words. You can think about what are the negative words you're hearing? What are the positive words you're hearing? What are the emotional words you're hearing? Is there more negative words at the beginning of this uh, interaction or at the end? What are the standout emotional words? And the emotional words are when you listen to something that's actually sort of slipping out in the background. Often what you hear is there's lots of factual, logical words in the foreground. And at the end of the sentence, somebody says something a little bit emotional and then they move on to the next sentence. And it's that piece that is almost hiding behind the other words that is worthwhile hanging on to. Don't dismiss it and think that could be something useful. I don't know. I'm just going to notice that it was there. Then listen to the tone behind this. Then listen to the overall body language. And to come back to what we talked about before, just notice okay, this person is saying something they seem to mean, the voice seems to mean it, but there is a bit of shake and a bit of stress about the body. Maybe they're feeling under pressure about this. Maybe there's more going on here uh, than the person can tell us. Maybe we really need to support our, our leader right now in this situation. And so, so do be aware of looking at the whole person, just as we would do with friends and family members. If you get to know people really well, then, uh, I mean, parents will know this, your child walks in the house and you instantly know if something's wrong. Uh, and we tend to, as children, sort of, we will show that more readily than, than when we're older. But if you're in a long-term relationship with anyone, they walk in the room and you know if they've had a great day or a bad day, you're reading everything from just the way they walk and they move. So if we can bring that power of deeply connected relationships where we are looking out for each other, we want to be connected and we want to see the whole person. If we bring that into the workplace, that's when we can start to have really connected teams. I can tell you right now that I know uh, when my wife is upset with me before she opens her mouth, right? So it's, it is something that you that you learn. But but how do we apply that into the workplace? Is an interesting question, Richard. And in in the uh, art of coaching, in the coaching practice, we use the exact term that you said a few moments ago. We call it seeing the whole of the person, and mm. we can tell you can get finely tuned into seeing when someone's in a reflective space where. You, well, you might actually just say nothing for a while and let them process whatever it is that they're, that they're reflecting on because it could be something very powerful that's going to come out of their mouth next or noticing shifts in their, in their stance, in their facial expressions, their eyes, noticing. The key word that you said there was noticing and seeing the whole of the person, looking for those little incongruences to see, well, actually some, there's something deeper there. And if they're your team member and you genuinely care about them and you're picking up, like Richard said, some kind of shakiness in the voice around a topic or whatever, explore it. Tell them, I noticed something shifting you there. Tell me more about what was it about that that happened there? Like, don't, don't kind of judge it. Uh, listen without judgment, but notice it and see if they would like to talk more about it could be something for uh, leaders at home to think about with your team members. Um, if you do genuinely care about them, you do want to know if there's something deeper that's going on within them uh, and that is incongruent with maybe the words that are coming out of their mouth. 
I think there's a great comment that you make there, Mick, about uh, talk about it without judgment and also with that, that compassionate space for, the, for them to open up to you. Uh, to tell you a funny story about this, uh, I think it was about 15 years ago, I was invited on uh, a radio show to talk about uh, body language. And uh, straight away, I thought, this, this doesn't sound like this interview is going to go that well, because uh, the, uh, the radio host... Uh, I was just waiting on the line and he probably didn't know that I, that I was listening at that point. They're about to go to an ad break and they were going to bring me on. And uh, he said, so coming up after the break, we got Richard Newman talking about body language. <laughs> that should be interesting. And went to the ad break. And I thought, oh, if I, what, what, is, what have I done to offend this guy? Like, what am I walking into in this situation? And so he came back from the ad break and he said, huh, so here's Richard Newman. Talks about body language. Uh, Richard Newman body language is a whole pile of rubbish, isn't it? And I said to him, it sounds like you've had maybe a, a negative experience with this subject. Can you tell me a bit more about that? And he said, yeah, well, there's this guy in my office. And the other day I was in a meeting talking to my boss and I just happened to scratch my nose. Uh, and, uh, and this guy said, ah, that means you're lying. I've seen it on the TV. And I wasn't lying because I, I just had an itchy nose. Uh, and so sometimes people have seen that little bit on the TV in some sort of uh, crime show and they think that they, they know everything about a person. And, it, and I said to him, is there anything else uh, about this? And he said, yeah, yeah. The other day I was just sort of standing talking to a colleague and I folded my arms and uh, he said, oh, you're being really defensive. Why are you folding your arms? I've seen it on the TV. And the guy said, I wasn't, I was just cold. I was wearing a like short sleeve shirt and there was air conditioning nearby. Uh, and so exactly as you said, Mick, you've got to in these situations, just if you do notice something, be aware that you're noticing something the person and hasn't vocalized at this point and just give them the space to maybe talk check in with them check in with compassion without judgment so you give them the space uh to uh to to, to be able to open up to you if they want to and just to finish the story about the uh, the radio host once i talked him through this and i said yeah this that doesn't sound like the right way to approach body language that's that's not how it works he suddenly flipped and said really you know, could, could you could you tell me what it really is then? Because uh, he knew that I wasn't there to sort of judge or poke fun or any of those things, but actually to, to give it the, the seriousness that the area deserves. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I love that. I'm going to remember that. And it's going to help me to always be uh, mindful. I'll use that as an anchor as well to, to be mindful about not being judgmental and just noticing and allowing the person to space uh, to, if they want to, talk about what's going on with them at that moment. I want to circle back one more time to the foothills of the Himalayas and with the Tibetan monks. Can I ask, what did you learn about yourself during that experience? Oh, wow. Uh, so much. I mean, for me, it was a, a transformative experience. There, there I was, uh, 18 years old when I, when I arrived there. I, I'd never been overseas without my parents. Uh, at this point, and uh, I had to learn so much in the way of uh, being self-sufficient, of sort of those general survival skills, just even to get there, to, to be able to find this uh, monastery, which was not that easy to find uh, up in sort of northeast uh, India. Uh, I learned, uh, I, I think it was there that I learned, actually, I quite like silence being in this monastery it was there that i began to discover that i oh, okay i'm i'm an introvert I'm, I'm okay with that what does that really mean i'm happy spending this time where many people who were going off to do that uh gap year of teaching abroad experience were going with pairs or with groups of people or maybe even a dozen people going to a particular area but i was very comfortable in the idea of, of going and being there uh by myself i think i learned that you can connect so much with another human being uh, and feel a strong sense of friendship and a sense of family with people just by sitting quietly and spending time with them and, and observing each other and getting to know each other. I think I learned a sense, a, a huge sense of uh, self-reliance and being able to achieve something that seems somehow impossible uh, at the time and another piece that, that you know really has driven me since then is I, I realized how much I passionately love helping people 
to communicate, whether that is going from no English to having some English uh, or, you know, people that, that we train today. And it really is a fuel for, for me being able to be in a room with people and help them go from whatever challenge they've got with communication to where they would like to be uh, is something where, you know, I, I feel um, you were mentioning to me a little bit earlier about being in a flow state. That is my flow state. It's a place where I feel like I don't, I don't need food. I don't need sleep. I just love that idea of, of helping people uh, come to life in, uh, and, and, and bring their voice to life in that way. Thank you for sharing that, Richard. That's wonderful. And, and obviously a, a very important step that has made up a lot of who you've become and, and progressed since then. So yeah, what, what a wonderful experience. I'm glad that you went through that because now the world benefits from, from that step that you made on your journey. I want to flip now to the next thing that you said, which I want to talk about this storytelling element. I want to start with, you mentioned some important words when you're talking about your acting stint. Mm -hmm. So when you were studying acting, you, the words that you used, if I can remember them correctly, were you're always initially thinking about the emotion that you want the audience to feel. Tell me about the connection of that with storytelling in a leadership context. Yeah, so uh, I think business storytelling is something that is deeply misunderstood. Uh, and so uh, if I reflect back a couple of years ago, because it's been a theme for, for a long time now, I was at a, uh, at a conference where there was a few people as a panel on stage uh, and they were leaders from different companies, different industries. And the, uh, the host said, well, storytelling is an important uh, issue. Do you all do storytelling? They all nodded their heads. And the host went to number one and said, so tell me, how, you, how do you do storytelling in your business? And he said, well, what I do is at my team meetings, I tell people what I did on the weekend. I give them little anecdotes about my holiday. And I was sitting there thinking, that, that's not business storytelling. I mean, that's, that can be a good thing to open up as a leader, but that's not really business storytelling. And then the next person talked about how uh, he would give people a list of things that he had achieved in his career to aim to inspire them in their careers. And again, I was thinking that isn't storytelling. That's a list. That's um, not what storytelling means. And so when it went through the panel, I think it was the last person who suddenly said what, what I would uh, agree to be storytelling in, in the truest sense. And storytelling, if, if you think about it, to link this back to that question about, you know, what do you want people to feel? If you think about a, a meeting, let's, let's just say that you've got a, a new product, a new service, or the rollout of a new message, a new way that people are going to work. Maybe there is a new sense of uh, a mission that you're on together this year towards a particular goal. Well, leaders can decide that piece and they can get very excited about it at a, an off-site meeting, team away day. Uh, they come up with it with sort of writing up on charts all over the wall and leave feeling thrilled by it. But whether or not it succeeds is going to depend on do the people that work with them actually feel like doing it? They might know what they're supposed to do, but do they feel committed to that vision in the same way as the people at the offsite are? Possibly not. And what storytelling does is it allows us to give people information in the way that the brain wants to receive it. The brain doesn't just want a list or random facts about your weekend. We need to engage the three major areas of the, of the brain relevant for storytelling, which is the survival mind, the emotional mind, and the logical mind. And so by, by doing that in, in the way that a, a story does, you compel people to listen. They are much more likely to remember your information and take action on it as well. And so too many meetings, we, we have, loads of people have said over the last couple of years that they got screen fatigue and Zoom fatigue, and they haven't really. They've just got death by PowerPoint on a laptop because they'll finish their day and then they go into the living room, they turn on Netflix and they'll watch it for three hours quite happily. So it's not necessarily screen fatigue, although there is some sort of eye fatigue we get with these laptops. Uh, but that the reason that we want to go and watch Netflix for a few hours is that it's giving us information in the way that we want to receive it. It's giving us a story. It is connecting with us. And so if you can tie that in as a business leader, if you understand the basic framework of a story, then you can do that for your next team meeting. You can do it for your next pitch. You can also do it for every one of your one-to-ones. And we even teach teams how to do it for emails as well. I mean, imagine if every email that you wrote, you knew before you opened it, exactly what was needed from you by when 
And when you opened it, it was written as a, a concise, compelling story that then led you clearly to the action that needed to be taken. Uh, and so that's what we do for people. And, and to, to give you a sense of how that works, if you look at the, um, the basic premise of how storytelling works, which is a lot, a lot of people look back to The Hero with a Thousand Faces, written by Joseph Campbell, where he came up with the 17 key steps that stories have. If you look at different civilizations around the world that had never had any contact with each other, they were using these 17 different steps. And you can look at ancient Greeks and the, uh, the story of Gilgamesh thousands of years ago, chipped into stone tablets, and look at Shakespeare, and you can compare them and see that, that those steps are being followed. But the challenge with that is that it's quite hard to follow the 17 steps of the hero's journey with the denial of the quest and the, the leaving of the ordinary world when you're writing an email. So we've boiled it all down for people into very simple areas of simply looking at it like this. If you watch any movie, you turn it on, if it's going to compel you to watch, at the beginning, you see the current world and the current challenges. Then what happens next is in most business meetings, they don't do storytelling. They say, and here's our solution. And that's where they lose everybody. You go from challenge across to solution. That's not storytelling, that's telling. So storytelling is here's the current world and the challenges. Now let's look at the better future. You see the hero, the protagonist of a movie having challenges and sensing a greater possible future. And they imagine what that could be and what it means to them in various different ways. They may be introduced to it by a mentor or something along those lines, but they see what that is. And then they embark on a journey that takes them from their current challenges to that better future. And that journey starts with a single step. You can take all of that into a meeting with your team. Let's say you're doing a rollout of a new initiative, something like that. The way to do it is you have to talk about the co context, the current challenges, and not dive across to the solution talk about this vision of this better future, not why it's better for the company and better for the leadership. It has to be better for Bob, who you're speaking to right now, and for Anne-Marie that you're speaking to. They need to understand what that better future means for them, what the journey looks like, and the first step they, they can take as they leave the room. And if you do that, you're doing everything that a great story would you know, maybe take three hours to do in the space of sort of a $300 million budget, and you're doing it in the space of a 10-minute team meeting or a two-hour client pitch, uh, leading people forwards. But the key bit behind it, to come back to your earlier question, is that what it does by creating it in this way is that it's engaging the emotional mind in a way the emotion says, I want this. I want to be part of this. This story in involves me. I'm going to start to take action on it in a way that bullet points and, uh, and a spreadsheet just can't uh, achieve. Can we unpack that emotion part of it a little bit more? So you, uh, the hero's journey, you know, well, well documented. And I like the way that you broke it down into a, a simpler rather than a 17 step approach. So where are we today? What are our challenges? What is, where is our desired state? Where do we want to be? And then what are some of the challenges that we might come along the way? What's the journey going to look like? And let's take the first step. So very good description of um, a model that everyone can put into play. How do we make sure that it's playing to the person's emotion rather than just saying facts and going, you know, here we are, this is where we need to be and here are the challenges, here are the first steps. How do we make sure that there's an emotional element in there that people will remember and get their buy-in and engaged into? Yeah, so I mean, I, I firmly believe that uh, for, for a leader to be effective, they need to understand uh, from their team, what does each person care about that is not related to money and time? So, of course, people in different businesses around the world, they have to, uh, they have to make money, they have to do it in a certain amount of time, otherwise the business collapses. So money and time are important, but the personal, each person has different values that they care about, things that are driving them in their work, things that drive them in their family life, um, things that give them a sense of meaning and fulfillment, and also values that are particularly at stake right now, uh, which could be for them the added weight and pressure of working from home while they've got three cats and two kids that they're homeschooling and the pressures that they're going through. You know, what is driving them right now? What is most important to them beyond the needs of the business? And what would be a much greater future for them, which might be different for each person? It could be a sense of uh, respect. It could be a sense of fulfillment. It could be 
uh, improving their personal reputation. It could be a whole range of pieces. And so that's where the emotion comes in because you can say, look, the, the numbers at the moment are 120 and we want to get the numbers to 145, go do it. And nobody's interested in that, it's just ridiculous. Uh, nobody ever, as a child, when they're asked, you know, what do you wanna be in your life? Uh, would you want to be an astronaut or what do you want to be? They don't, they don't say, well, I want to get the number 120 up to 145. Forget it. But what they do care about is you know, what's driving them, which is their core personal values. And uh, and as a leader, it's important to be able to, to, to understand that and to have conversations with the people we work with to understand you know, what, what's happening for them right now. How do they feel about it and what is driving their behavior? And by doing that, you get connected to them on a human level. You feel more connected. And when you explain information that's important through the power of a story, you're going to be able to connect their emotions because it's connected with their identity, their, their core sense of purpose. Uh, and that is what drives a protagonist through a story. And that's what all co also can drive your team uh, to take important and ongoing action towards those goals. I feel like we've uncovered something really important here, Richard, that there's a common theme in everything that we've discussed today when it comes to leadership of your team and this word connectedness and taking the time to treat your team like they matter, to make them feel like they matter, taking to the time to understand who they are, what drives them, what their personal values are. And the more that you know about your team, the more you can now use Richard's approach with storytelling in something that's going to draw out an emotion that, that will actually be impactful to that individual, right? So it's all about this human connectedness. Really take the time to understand your team. What makes them tick? Uh, what gets them out of bed every morning? What makes them proud? What makes them frustrated? Whatever, it, all of those, once again, emotional words, the more that you know your team, the more that you can inspire them into meaningful action, whether it be through storytelling or if we think all the way back to noticing any shifts in them, like the, all the way coming back to the body language stuff. When you've taken the time to know your team, it's then that you can notice changes that are out of the normal because you're used to them. Like I said before, I, I know if my wife is upset with me before she even opens her mouth because I know her. You need to get to that level with your team where you can notice out of the norm behaviors where there's something going on there and something that you want to explore and know more about out of genuine care for that person. And then building up that knowledge of who they are is then going to make your storytelling incredibly powerful because you'll be playing to your audience and, and being able to pitch your story about that vision of the future in terms that resonate with them and motivate and inspire them. Any reflection on that summary that all of these things are connected to connectedness? Yeah, I absolutely believe it because, uh, you know, in order for anybody to uh, be led uh, in any organization, in any team, they've, they've got to feel that they matter, that the person that they're being led by cares about them, that there is, there's, there's a sense of importance and purpose about them being there. And so, you know, where leadership, if we can call it that, uh, many years back, decades back in corporations might have come from your job title, the hierarchy and giving direct instructions and people feeling that they should follow them because they were grateful for, for having a, a career ladder perhaps. Uh, but, but these days that, that sense of true connectedness is something that people are craving. People are starving for this sense of connection where we've been missing it so much over the last couple of years. And uh, so many people have left their companies and decided to go and work somewhere else or maybe start their own thing or just be freelance uh, because they're not feeling connected. And so we have to make sure in, in our organizations, in our teams, in our family, in our community, that people feel connected with us, that they feel a, a sense of importance and care um, with, with us in, in each interaction because it, that's, that's core to us it called to our humanity, called to our sense of, of, of worth and uh, the, the value of, of being here on this planet and being alive is that, that need that human beings have to, to connect with others. And so the more that you can do that, the more that you can bring that to life in your interactions and ensure that that's happening with the other inter interactions and protecting that sense of the culture 
with the team around you, then, then the better off that people are going to feel, the more they're going to want to be part of that team uh, and uh, help that team succeed. Thank you, Richard. One, wonderful summary. And I think that might be a good segue now to talk about Leaders Lift. So you talk about having one secret that transforms your influence and your ability to inspire, motivate and lead. What is Leaders Lift? Yeah, so uh, Leaders Lifting is uh, just a very simple concept that brings together everything really that we've been teaching for more than two decades, which is that uh, for me, I believe that the, the purpose of an interaction is to elevate the other person or the other people. So they go from a negative or a neutral state to a positive or a more useful state. And if you can do that, then the person will enjoy having spent time with you and uh, look forward to spending time with you again. And you can do this in the hardest of situations and the simplest of situations. Of course, you can do it if you're going to inspire your team. Of course, you're going to do it at a, like a sales kickoff with lots of investment happening and rewards and bonuses that are going to happen there. But I encourage um, leaders and people in general to think about this in the hardest moments that you have. And so many of us have had really hard situations to deal with uh, in business and in life over the last couple of years. Uh, and so if you can think in yourself, firstly, before you approach your day, lift yourself, get yourself to the place where you feel that uh, you're primed and ready for uh, doing everything that you can for your organization to serve the other people around you. So you've lifted your mind, you've lifted your state, so you're ready to go into each interaction to lift others. But once you've done that, once you've focused on yourself, you then need to, to focus outwards on the people that you're speaking to, to think, my job here in this very tough conflict resolution, in this challenging conversation with a member of staff who hasn't been performing and has been disruptive, my aim at all times is to stay lifted in myself and to help lift this person. And at, at all times, it should never be patronizing. It should never be judgmental. It comes from seeing the greatness in that person and helping them to see it in themselves as well. And if you truly have to do it, it cannot be a manipulation. Uh, and this is so powerful to come right back to, to the beginning of, of where my, my company started is that when I came home from working with the monks and I, I studied acting, uh, the little transition that happened was that my hairdresser was talking to me one day and he said, what, what is it that you do? And I talked to him about you know, the journey that I've had with the monks and studied acting. And he said, if I gave you a free haircut, could you teach my team everything you know about communication? And I said to him, I, I can't do that. I don't, I don't do that. I, maybe you've misunderstood. He said, no, no, you're going to do it. I'm going to give you a free haircut. You're going to do it. And he saw something in me that I had no idea I was capable of. And uh, I came back. I did this. I got a free haircut. And, uh, and I thought, thank goodness that went okay. And I was about to leave. And he said, when are you coming back? We want you back next week. Uh, and, uh, and then I got a phone call sort of a few, few sessions on from an engineering company where this guy said, I've just had my hair cut today and I hear that you're the UK's best communication expert. Can you come and train my team? And I said, sure. Uh, and then I had to figure out, okay, how am I going to get a website and how am I going to get like business cards and start this rolling and, and did it and just word of mouth took off. And it took off because one person saw something in me that I didn't know I had. He sort of reminded me of my full potential. And so for leaders to lift others, I think it's key for every leader to do this, to see the complete and full potential that somebody has, not just in the numbers they're presenting to you with their KPIs this week, but truly see their potential. And by seeing it in them, they will realize it as well and, and, and want to work with you, but also want to fulfill that potential too. And if, if all leaders can manage to, to lift those around them, whether that means that you're doing it as a leader in your family, doing it for your children, you're doing it for your friends, your, your family, even doing it for your parents. If you can do it in any situation, just imagine the ripple effect that that has uh, on, uh, on the people around us. There's so many powerful things that's coming out of there, Richard, and I've got to start with, it sounds like barbershops were linked in before LinkedIn existed, right? So, <laughs> so the referral, that's what I think you're more. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, yeah, so uh, if I unpack a little bit what you said, so starting with self, uh, when you're getting ready for uh, uh, an important moment in your work, making sure that you, you yourself are lifted and in a game frame before you have that important conversation and then your role to elevate others that's really powerful help them see what others may or may not see but help them see their 
superpower, help them gain the confidence of that superpower and elevate them and then give them the environment where that superpower can thrive and, and uh, flourish. And every single person on this planet has got a superpower and part of your role as a leader is to help them see it and to help them to thrive uh, upon it. Thank you so much, Richard. I've thoroughly enjoyed today's uh, episode. So many nuggets of gold here. I want to draw us uh, to a close now, uh, and I'm going to go into our rapid fire round, but I'll just summarize some of the key things that we've been going through. Talking about this personal presence and congruence and connectedness, talking about the science of storytelling and bringing it to emotion that, that resonates with the person that you're speaking with because you know them, you've taken the time to know them. The importance of lifting and elevating others with this concept of leaders lift. Absolutely wonderful. So many nuggets of gold today, Richard. In our rapid fire round, there's a few questions that we ask all of our guests. Everything else is unscripted on this show. For, for those in the audience that don't know that, this is an unscripted show every week that we listen to our, our guest and we look to learn as much as we can from them. The rapid fire round, uh, Richard, the first question for you, it's going to be really interesting thinking about what you did when you were 18, but what's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? And we usually use 20. I'm going to change it for you. What's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 18? Oh, such a great question. Um, one thing I wish I knew, um, I think the one thing I wish I knew that was that it was all going to work out. Hmm. Uh, but, uh, but saying that if I knew that, then would I have, would I have worked and persisted and, and worked as hard as I did? I, I don't know, but I, I think just that sense of, uh, I think many of us when we're 18 have that burning desire to sort of get out there and, and make something of ourselves and, and we're not sure where it's going to head. Uh, but just to have that sense of, of ease that, you know, if you, if you have good intention and you apply yourself and you have patience and persistence, it, it will work out. That's an interesting reflection. I just noticed something in you there when you were reflecting on that and, and saying, well, yeah, part of it, you want to know that everything's going to be okay, but you also need that ability to push yourself just beyond the edge of your comfort zone where great things happen. And I, I like the way that you, I, I could see you processing that kind of balance in your head. You want yeah. some comfort, but you don't want to be too comfortable because otherwise action doesn't happen. Yeah. Mm. All right. What's your favorite book? Oh gosh, my favorite book. Um, that's such a hard question to answer because I, I have favorite books in different places. Uh, the, the one that's, uh, th there's two that's ju jumped to mind that I've read in the last couple of months that, that have really stayed with me. I love a book that I read and it stays with me afterwards. I've just recently read uh, Will Smith's autobiography, which is extraordinary. And I was lucky enough to see him live in person in London when he, he came here to, to launch the book. Uh, and I think it's just a brilliant and very vulnerable um, description of his life, uh, which I saw uh, Oprah Winfrey described it as the greatest autobiography she's ever read. Wow. Uh, and I, and I, I'd agree with that. I think it's brilliant. Another book I've really enjoyed recently was uh, David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me. Again, it, it's an autobiographical, but it's, it's lessons that he gives you about the extraordinary experiences that he's been through and lessons for living that, that have come out of that, that he shares uh, after every chapter. So to, two brilliant books you, you can't go wrong there I'll, I'll warn you if you're planning to read them there's a fair amount of swearing in both of those books okay. uh but uh but they are they are captivating in the way that they're written all right well, thank you for sharing those and what's your favorite quote oh my favorite quote um i think my favorite quote actually i'm going to attribute this to uh ollie Mivel, who uh, who i knew back at school that we went to school together from the age of 12 and uh when i went to live uh, with the monks. He, uh, he created this cassette. This is how old it was, how old I am. He created this cassette uh, that he put sort of music on for me because he knew that I was going to arrive in Delhi and I was going to spend two days on the train trying to get across to find this monastery. So he said, well, this would be, you know, some nice music that you can listen to on the way. But inside the cassette, when I took it out, it just said three words, which was fulfill your potential. And that quote stayed with me to this day, so decades later, uh, which, you know, I was talking earlier about, uh, it's nice to know things will work out, but that you need to have that sense of drive. And those three words have been a, a huge sense of the drive that I have 
every day is to fulfill it and explore uh, you know my potential uh, as a human being and all that I can be and do and serve uh, for other people through uh, through pursuing those three simple words absolutely love it and I love that you can reflect on that now a pivotal moment that happens uh, uh, a while back and Ollie well done uh, inspired someone into meaningful action there so thank you for sharing that Richard and finally I've learned so much from today's episode and I know that our audience would have well as would have as well Richard how do people get in contact with you to find out more about what you do and if they want to get you know take advantage of your services read your book etc how do they find you uh, so the best way to find me and my team is at ukbodytalk.com so you'll find me there you'll find uh, all our team and our services there and if you want to follow me on social media i'm on instagram at richard newman speaks and also on linkedin uh, richard newman from body talk Brilliant. Thank you again, Richard. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for sharing so openly and candidly with our audience and so many nuggets of gold of things that we can put into meaningful action. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Nick. 